Wow, a lot, lot of interest in, in, in voting rights. Who, who, who would have guessed? Um, the League of Women Voters is here? Yes, okay. Shout out for the League of Women Voters. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, uh, Lisa Muscatine. And if you haven't guessed, we have a terrific program for you this afternoon. Uh, Featuring Professor uh, Professor Rick uh, uh, Hasen, uh, Rick Has Hassan, Rick Hassan. Sorry, Rick. Uh, I rehearsed this before I came out. Um, uh, he's he's written a, a book uh, that, that makes a compelling case for a constitutional amendment uh, on voting, and he's going to um, participate in a discussion here uh, with uh, a couple of dis uh, other, other distinguished panelists and um, and a distinguished uh, moderator. Uh, Rick is a professor of law and political science at, at UCLA, and uh, uh, he's the director of the Safeguarding Democracy Project there at UCLA's law school. Uh, he's an expert in election law, uh, and his new book, A Real Right to Vote, uh, argues that a constitutional amendment on Liars voting, uh, a constitutional amendment um, on voting would serve to do several things. It would fully protect voting rights, uh, more fully than the current Constitution does. It would make elections more secure. Uh, and it would deter future attempts to subvert elections. Now, who can be against uh, any, any of that, right? Um, yeah, yeah. OK, um, that was a rhetorical question. Uh, so uh, Kirkus, Kirkus called Rick's book, uh, quote, a persuasive, up-to-date proposal that deserves widespread attention which it's, it's going to get today. Uh, and it's, it's going to get a, a particularly close attention uh, this afternoon by, by this uh, group of, um, of esteemed panelists. Uh, they, they, they are uh, Democratic Congressman Jamie Raskin, You can bring up your other issues with him at another time. Let's try to stay focused today. He, of course, is a constitutional law expert um, and represents Maryland's 8th District and has done so since 2017. How many here from the Eighth District? Okay, great. And of course, uh, you may have noticed he served on the January 6th uh, Select Committee. Uh, he's authored several books, his most recent being Unthinkable, which chronicled his own trauma in early 2021 as he grieved the suicide of his son while leading the second impeachment proceedings against uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Sherilyn Eiffel is also here. She's a, a lawyer as well. And uh, from 2013 to 2022, she served as president and, and director counsel of the N NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Uh, this year, she's joining, or have you already joined, Cheryl? Yeah, she's joined the, the, uh, the uh, faculty at Howard Law School, um, and it's, uh, it's become the, the founding director there of the 14th Amendment Center for Law and Democracy. Um, and you have a, a book soon coming out, right? OK. Uh, be sure to mention it. Um, okay. um, now, moderating the discussion will be Pam Fessler, who was a journalist uh, for a long time. Um, and 20, 28 years she spent just at, at NPR, uh, where as a correspondent on the national desk, she covered voting issues along with uh, other issues like uh, poverty, philanthropy. Um, uh, poverty and Philanthropy. Her, her book four years ago, Carville's Cure, told the, the story of the only leprosy colony in the continental United States that's located in Louisiana. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Rick uh, Hassan and all the panelists. feel like a movie director up here. These, these are very great. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for coming. What a crowd. This is amazing on this uh, very non-snowy Saturday in Washington. Um, so Rick has written this very uh, interesting, great book about a topic obviously many people care about. And um, 
I'm going to start a little first, Rick, with you. I, I think a lot of people in this country would be very surprised to know that the U.S. Constitution does not affirmatively state that we have the right to vote. We have amendments that prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex and, and, um, and race. Um, but we don't have an affirmative right to vote as other countries, some other countries do, democracies do. So why is that the case? And what do you think the impact has been? Well, that's a great question to start. And let me thank you all for coming. And I'm happy to write on the coattails of Sherilyn, Jamie, and Pam for you <laughs> all to come out and, and talk about these ideas. Um, when the United States Constitution uh, was um, uh, first written and, and ratified, uh, it uh, had very little protection for voting. It said that for the president, the state legislature's pick, for the Senate, the state legislature's pick, and for the House, there's going to be a vote, but states decide who's qualified to vote. And so you had all kinds of restrictions on the basis of race and gender and property ownership. It was not a very protective uh, of democracy document. And then as there were political struggles to uh, improve voting rights in this country, it led to a series of amendments that were all written in the negative. So if you're going to hold an election, don't discriminate on the basis of race or gender or age between 18 and 20. It never uh, has had an affirmative right to vote, even though there have been proposals going back to the original discussion of passage of the 15th Amendment uh, after the Civil War. There was talk of an affirmative right to vote. And throughout history, there's been this talk. But as recently as 2000, in the case of Bush versus Gore, the case that ended the, the dispute over, over whether Bush or Gore was going to win the election uh, in Florida and therefore in the country, the Supreme Court reminded us, we have no right to vote for president. And even though states have graced us with this right, they could take it back at any time in a future election. Not in a current election, that's what we saw in 2020, but in a future election. So our Constitution still has that. And so it occurred to me that many of the problems that we see today in our country with uh, all the fights over voting, it's not normal if you go around the rest of the world, you do not see in France or in Australia or in Canada, they're worried, are we going to have a fair election? Are there going to be armies of lawyers massing with different rules? That's just not how it's done. And a big part of the reason for that is because our Constitution is very old and does not affirmatively protect that right to vote. And, and in your book, you're proposing that we do, in fact, try and ratify such an, uh, such an amendment. Um, what do you think that the impact would be? How would it change? what we're seeing now in terms of challenges to voting rights. Right. So I can't answer that without saying something negative about the Supreme Court, which is that. <laughs> uh, so I don't need to do it. No. I was going to let Cheryl so, so, so we've got 235 years of Supreme Court history. And about eight of them, the Supreme Court was really protective of voting rights. Um, I'll tell you two, two quick stories. In 1874, uh, a white Missouri woman uh, named Virginia Minor went to the Supreme Court and said, I'm a citizen. Uh, the 14th Amendment protects the, citizen, the, protects the privileges or immunities of citizenship. I'm, not, I'm being denied the vote because I'm a woman. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, you're a citizen, but that's not a, voting is not a privilege of citizenship. Even worse, in 1903, a man named Jackson Giles went to the Supreme Court. He said, I'm an adult citizen, resident of Alabama. I'm being denied the right to vote because of my race. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, there is a 15th Amendment, but there's nothing we can do about it. And throughout history, the courts have not been protective of voting rights, except for a small period in the Warren Court. And those Warren Court precedents are the ones that protect us the most. As I argue in the book, they're in danger. We shouldn't think that this Supreme Court is going to uphold the one person, one vote rule going forward, or say that even citizen adult residents, people who've completed their felony, um, uh, convictions, that those people are protected in the right to vote. And so I feel like we're going to have a retrogression, so we need it now. And the last thing I'll say is this is not something I expect to happen in the next two years. Democrats couldn't even pass a voting rights statute. They couldn't pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Amendment Act. They couldn't pass the For the People Act. This is a long-term project. Well, so actually, we have no problem passing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't mean Democrats in the House. 
Uh, so if you look at the history of the 19th Amendment, 1874, um, Minor versus Happersett, after that, there was movement in the states. By the time we get to 1920 and the passage of the 19th Amendment that uh, enfranchised women, or at least said you couldn't discriminate against women in enfranchising, over 30 states had put a right to vote for women in their state constitutions. We need to think long term. We can't be lurching from crisis to crisis in every election, which is what I think we're doing right now. So, uh, Sherilyn, um, you have spent most of your career, um, much of it in court, fighting uh, to protect voting rights. Um, and I, I was struck by this line in Rick's book, uh, which he kind of alluded to here, and he said that um, uh, in recent years, courts have been the last place that voting rights activists have wanted to be to protect voting rights. So is, is that what you found to be true? And then do you think that such an amendment would, would actually address the challenges that you face in court? Um, yeah, it is, it is absolutely true. I mean, within a larger context. And that larger context is that um, if we look at the Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which are the three amendments designed to ensure the full citizenship of black people in this country, the 13th Amendment ending slavery, the 14th Amendment guaranteeing equal protection, the 15th Amendment um, with that negative, um, you know, you, you can't abridge the right to vote based on race or color. Um, you know, of the, you know, 156 or so years that we've had these amendments, there have only been like 20 in which the Supreme Court has been um, vigorous in upholding and um, fully realizing the promise of those three amendments. That is the truth. And they were compelled to do it by circumstances that changed in this country in the post-war period, including the civil rights movement um, and a whole variety of changes that were happening in this country that created a different context for the court. But it is not natural for the court to be um, upholding voting rights or expanding those rights. And so Rick is absolutely right about that. Um, when you talk about the court being the last place to go, um, you know, for many years, a lot of the work that we tried to do was keep cases out of the Supreme Court um, so that we could hold on to critical precedents that were important. And it's so interesting in the insider Washington kind of Supreme Court litigators game, you know, it's like, how many cases have you argued? How many cases do you have in the Supreme Court? And, and I have to say, you know, at LDF, when I was there as a young lawyer and later, you know, it was, we were not trying to get to the Supreme Court, to be honest with you. Those days had long passed where that was the place where salvation was going to be. So, um, but you do have to deal with the Supreme Court because things are going to end up there. And the reality is you have to figure out how to navigate um, this court, which sometimes we do effectively and sometimes we're not able to do because the court is hell-bent on the solution that they want. And so I say all of that to swing back around to the beginning of this, which is why I so appreciate Rick's book, which is, as he says, um, we need a new paradigm, you know? And many of us are focused, appropriately so, on this year's elections and what it's going to mean for our democracy going forward. And I absolutely believe that this year is critical to whether or not we actually are a democracy this time next year in this room having this conversation, which will be allowed in this place, but there will be many places in the country where it's not allowed. So I do think that that's what's at stake. But I also think that should we get past that moment, should we get past next year as a democracy, this is the work that we need to be doing. Because we are in this situation because we have uncovered so many of the flaws and weaknesses in our democracy. While there have been these huge you know, flag-waving encomiums to our Constitution, it's actually deeply flawed and it needs correction and it needs shoring up. And I think Rick's book is so important to helping people begin to think about that project, because it will take years. It's not something that you're going to do in a year. And amending the Constitution is no small feat. So I just think it's great that um, Rick has done the work of laying this out for us. So Congressman, um, you, you probably understand the politics behind this probably more than anybody. Um, and as Rick <laughs> and as Rick mentioned, um, the U.S. House, is, they, they, they can't even pass any voting right, or Congress can't even pass any voting rights legislation these days. Given that and, and the way the trends seem to be going, it seems to me that we have almost an increase in people who are resisting this kind of change. Mm -hmm. How do you see, what do you think the prospects of this kind of an amendment would be? And how, how would it happen? I mean, how would, how would you make it happen? Um, first, thank you, Pam, and it's an honor to be here. 
uh, with um, my old buddy Rick Hassan from my days uh, being a law professor in the great Sherilyn Eiffel. And uh, I'm delighted to be part of the conversation. Um, as Rick knows, I've been uh, harping on this point for a long time. And uh, as I sped read your book, I even came across some conferences and my articles we did a long time ago about this. I remember w uh, talking about it actually before the 2000 election. And I was being chastened by some people saying, don't tell people there's not a constitutional right to vote, because the Republicans will take advantage of that. Um, and next thing you know, when you open up Bush versus Gore, there's a line that jumps off of the page, which is, of course, there being no uh, constitutionally protected individual right to vote, comma, uh, the, the right to vote for president uh, rests only with the state legislatures and their power to appoint electors however they see fit. Um, so, um, look, w for the reasons that Rick set out at the beginning, that we didn't start with a constitutional right to vote in the country. We started as a slave republic of white male property owners in the states with the states controlling the franchise. We've tried to evolve beyond that with a series of anti-discrimination amendments like the 15th Amendment, um, the 17th Amendment shifting the mode of election from the uh, of U.S. senators from the legislatures to the people, the 19th Amendment giving us women suffrage, the 23rd Amendment giving people in D.C. at least the right to vote for president, the 24th Amendment saying no poll taxes in federal elections, the 26th Amendment lowering the voting age or saying you can't discriminate based on age below, uh, uh, below 18. Um, well, th those are attempts to get at what the vast majority of the countries actually have on Earth today, which is a universal affirmative declaration that everybody's got a right to vote at every level of government over them. You look at the new South Africa Constitution, that's how it starts. And really, that should be the foundation, the cornerstone of any democratic constitution in the 21st century. Um, so we, we kind of have to catch up with ourselves. Now, um, the, the, the problem, and I think this is ultimately the solution too, but the problem is that our whole electoral system is broken even way beyond that. And I certainly don't need to tell that to an audience in Washington, D.C., which is the only national capital on planet Earth where the people are not represented in their own federal parliament. Uh, you know, a... Um, Say, you know, a population of 713,000 tax paying draftable citizens um, who don't get to vote for uh, voting representatives in the House or uh, in the Senate. We got three and a half million uh, people, uh, U.S. citizens in Puerto Rico who aren't represented. American Samoa, Guam, Virgin Islands. We still have several million former prisoners still disenfranchised in how many states, Sherilyn? Is it seven or eight that are still? Yeah, I think it's eight. Yeah, eight states. So the vast majority of the country has made the decision that if you've done good time, you've gotten out, you get every other right restored to you, um, then you get your voting rights back. But not in Florida, for example, where even though the people voted for that, the legislature continues to you know, try to pull defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, so uh, Rick is so right to emphasize that this is a continuing struggle. But I think that ultimately that's going to be the solution, that there is so much dissatisfaction um, with the voter suppression tactics, with the gerrymandering of state and federal districts, with judicial interference to stop the counting of ballots, as we saw in Bush versus Gore, that people will demand it. But I think Sherilyn rightly points out that amending the Constitution, um, it's probably necessary but it's certainly not going to be sufficient because what the people give through the Constitution, the Supreme Court can take away in a Supreme Court decision. And a great example of that is the way they've been shredding the Voting Rights Act itself in Shelby County versus Holder. So I think that the answer is we need a movement that's going to be fighting at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, at the statutory level, and at the constitutional level to get people the right to vote because that moves us towards the more perfect union. So I'll ask you too, Rick. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed recently covering um, voting is that there actually is a sizable portion of people in this country who do not think that voting is a right. 
They think it's a privilege that needs to be earned. And this is what they argue in terms of opposing things like automatic voter registration, online voter race registration, uh, uh, giving people with felony convictions the franchise. And this actually seems to be growing to me, this, this segment. So given that, just really how do you see this idea of um, amending the Constitution gaining traction? Yeah, so I don't think that it's new that there's a divide over the purpose of voting. And in fact, I talk about in the book that there's really long-standing two conceptions of the right to vote in this country. One is that the purpose of voting is to choose the best candidates or make the best choice on a ballot measure. And if you're going to be choosing the best candidates, it's like a test. Well, maybe we need to impose restrictions. Maybe someone has to like listen to NPR for three hours a day before we're going to let them vote. <laughs> Um, that would be very sad. Uh, <laughs> property restrictions, race restrictions, they were all justified based on, you know, we need to limit the franchise. Um, and and as, as recently as about a decade ago, Jonah Goldberg wrote a column in the, in the Los Angeles Times saying voting should be harder for everybody. It should be hurdles. You should demonstrate yes. your, uh, you know, your willingness to overcome obstacles. The other conception of voting is the conception that voting is about dividing power among political equals. And if that's the conception, that's the conception that, that, that I believe in, and it's the conception that I think is the conception that came out of the Warren Court in the 1960s, then though imposing those kinds of things is impermissible. Back in, 19, um, in the 1960s, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a person who was in the Army, his name was Herbert Carrington. He was a sergeant in the Army. He moved from Alabama to El Paso, Texas. He got stationed in White Sands, New Mexico. He moved his family to, um, uh, to El Paso. And he went to vote in the Republican primary. And he was told that in Texas, military uh, members were not allowed to vote uh, unless they were uh, already uh, citizens, uh, residents of uh, Texas before they joined the military. This was in the Texas Constitution. He had to go all the way to the Supreme Court, a case called Carrington versus Rash. And up at the Supreme Court, and this is a good example of this, uh, Texas argued, first they said, people who are in the military, they're not really residents because they're trans transients. And the court said, some of these people are there for many years. So that didn't work. And then they said, if we allow people in the military to vote, it's going to change the outcome of elections. And they're going to swamp, they're going to swamp the votes of like the real people who live in the area. And this idea, uh, the, and the Supreme Court said you cannot fence people out. You know, this is a feature, not a bug of democracy that when people vote, it might change election outcomes. But this idea, Texas used this, I tell the story in the book of um, Prairie View A&M University, a historically black college in Waller County, Texas, where for decades, uh, local registrars made it very difficult for black college students to be able to register to vote. And I talk about the story in North Dakota of Native American voters, where all of a sudden, after Heidi Heitkamp barely squeaked by her US Senate race with the help of Native voters in the state, the state said, you know what, now you have to show proof of a residential street address, which is no burden on anyone unless you live on an Indian reservation, in which case it's a huge burden. And so we have this long history. Uh, Jamie is exactly right. This is going to be a political struggle. But it's a struggle that will pay dividends along the way. So if in certain states, like Michigan, where you know, the, 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 the initiative process has been used, you can strengthen state constitutions. Every state constitution contains some right to vote, but they're not necessarily all so strong. We can start at the state and local level and build a national movement, because it's a fight over ideas. And it's the idea of, do, are we, do we really want to be a modern multiracial democracy or not? Yeah, and, and Sherilyn, uh, uh, you know, Rick does make this point that just the process of um, trying to get this amendment ratified will come with benefits in that it will, might change the political dialogue and maybe get Democrats to enact other um, measures that they might not otherwise to protect voting rights. I'm curious if you agree with that, if you, if you do see some, um, um, you know, side benefits along the way, because, I mean, you do admit, Rick, that this is going to be really, if, if it could even materialize, a really, really difficult thing to enact. So. Yeah, I mean, I would have to confess my um, gravest concern about a movement to um, 
create a constitutional amendment to vote is that I am deeply skeptical about the wisdom of opening up the Constitution to amendment at this time in our country, period. Mm -hmm. um, it is such an ugly, such a volatile, such a reactionary time that it is not clear to me that even if we could get it there, it wouldn't come with greater detriments in terms of the kinds of other things people might want to see in the Constitution. That being said, the principal benefit for me is that we now need to be in this, um, I think in this period where we're taking a very hard and adult look at what is deficient in our democratic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. and, and this compels that conversation. The reason that we're in a, a crisis is because there are built-in flaws in our democratic infrastructure. And when we start having that conversation in a robust way, that's a, so much a better conversation and a more important conversation than talking about Democrats or Republicans, than talking about partisanship. Not that I have any problem talking about partisanship, and not that I have any problem identifying which party is currently standing against democracy. The problem with the framing of it as pure partisanship is to go back to Rick's many examples. It suggests that there was some golden period when we didn't have a voting rights problem, and I've been a voting rights lawyer since 1988. So I don't, this is not a recent thing, right? Um, and, and even this point that Rick is raising about, you know, whether, or that you raised, Pam, that about whether people think it's a privilege, and, and, and Rick said that it kind of falls into two camps. I think about Medgar Evers, and there's a wonderful new book by Joy Reid out about Medgar Evers, uh, the great voting rights activist from Mississippi, and his wife, Merle Evers. Um, Medgar Evers served in the United States military in World War II, this black man. He was at D-Day. He was one of the people, black soldiers, who worked on supplying the troops on D-Day. He came back home to Mississippi. He was a man of extraordinary character, courage, uh, and pride. And he became the leading voice around voting in Mississippi. He chaired, he was the head of the Mississippi NAACP and he was the field secretary, and this was his cause celeb. And as we all know, um, because of that, he was assassinated on his, driver, on his driveway in front of his wife and children the very night that President Kennedy was giving his powerful speech about the need for a Civil Rights Act. What made many of those black men come back from the war and begin to activate that fight for voting rights was because of the reasons that you just described. Draftable men who had served their country who had been abroad, who had risked their lives, came home, and even though, of course, they and their parents and their grandparents had lived as second-class citizens, they said no more. So I think the conversation about what it means to be a citizen in this, in my 14th Amendment Center, I'm returning to this question of privileges and immunities of citizenship. We have the right to decide what they are. We don't have to follow Minor versus Happersat in, in the following way. I don't mean that we get to defy Supreme Court precedent. But since the Supreme Court has reminded us that Sometimes we just overturn Supreme Court precedent. Um, those are the kinds of things we should be thinking and talking about. Why should we, as a modern republic and the most powerful democracy in the world, be bound by a decision that says voting is not part of the package of what makes you a citizen? We don't say that about jury service. We realize that jury service is part of the privilege um, and, and immunity of citizenship. But we've allowed this to continue. So I think once, you know, as Rick cracks open that door about these, these, this fundamental flaw in our Constitution, it leads us into all of these other conversations that ultimately I think are critical for this moment. And so I think it, you know, and there's a part of Rick's book where he kind of talks about the cascading issues. It allows us to talk about the Senate. Right? It allows us to talk about you know, why Wyoming should have the same number of senators as the state of California, right? given the popul population differentials. We have structural flaws in our constitution and in the institution, particularly the political institutions of our republic, mm -hmm. that we should be able to recognize as mature citizens and set about trying to correct. And I think this is what helps us have that conversation. First of all, Congressman, if you, if you want to add anything to that, or also I, I, would, I would like you, if you would, just kind of address that concern that um, Sherilyn raised about, you know, are there risks 
to tr this effort to open up the Constitution. I know there are a lot of concerns about, uh, you know, a constitutional convention could be a disaster, but even this process of trying to get the states to ratify it, is there some risk attached that might not be make it worthwhile or might backfire? Yeah. Um, first, let me agree really strongly with what uh, Sherilyn said about how um, the, a constitutional amendment right to vote uh, strategy and conversation can open up um, roots of thinking about other problems that affect us. And we're actually living in a time of a lot of electoral innovation and uh, ingenuity. Uh, and um, um, I, I, I see my friend Rob Ritchie here from uh, Fair Vote, and Cindy's here, and uh, from, um, remind me the name of um, Represent Women. Represent Women. Um, and, um, the, you know, b b I am the sponsor for the ranked choice voting legislation uh, th in Congress to require ranked choice voting across the country in federal elections. And so I think, the, and then there's a lot of movement on that at the state and local level now. There's a lot of innovation taking place which have to do with making voting more meaningful and more effective. Um, and so I think in, in that context, a right to vote constitutional uh, amendment is not in any sense a, a diversion of energy, but it's a way of unifying people's interest in making sure that we're moving forward. Tocqueville said in Democracy in America that he observed that elections and voting rights in America are either shrinking and shriveling away or they're growing, they're expanding, and we've got to get back on the growth track. But on the constitutional point, um, you know, I am not so afraid that if we talk about amending the Constitution, the traditional way it's been done, a two-thirds vote in the House and the Senate, three-quarters of the states, as opposed to an Article V uh, constitutional convention. But if we talk about doing it the traditional way, I'm not afraid that that will open things up to, uh, you know, balanced budget amendment, school prayer amendment, uh, anti-choice human life amendment. Why? Because they're already doing all those things. They're they're already there. It's not like we'll give them the idea if they see that you know we want to get back on a pro-democracy path in terms of constitutional progress. So you know I've always thought that you know liberals should not be fraidy cats about uh, amending the Constitution. Um, and again, if you look at the history of the 17 amendments we've had since the original Bill of Rights, the vast majority have been pro-democracy, equality expanding, um, union deepening amendments. And so I think we need to just renew our momentum in that direction. And a voting rights amendment very much follows that way. Um, I think that Rick's point about the state constitutions is a good one because when you look at any pro-democracy constitutional amendment we've had, almost all of them have followed upon the heels of states organizing first to provide the missing right to vote. So for example, before the 19th Amendment was adopted, um, I think a majority of states had given women the right to vote by state law or by state constitution. And even the 17th Amendment, before it shifted this, the mode of selecting U.S. senators from legislatures to the people, most states had said, we're just going to go ahead and have an election, an advisory election by the people, but the legislatures will be bound by it or will follow can what I, the people say. Can I say. raise one point, though? I mean, I, I, you, I'm convinced. I'm convinced. You all convinced me. But <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me say this. I, every time we say a majority of states and we talk about things starting in states, we're not talking about the states where I do and have done most of my work, right? So 52% of black people live in the South. And no matter what innovations happen, unless they happen at a constitutional or federal <laughs> statutory level, you're leaving out the, the, you know, Alabama's not doing, not doing a state constitution that's going to expand the right to vote. And this is, you know, I'm saying this as a way of saying this is why I support anything that's at the level of federal statute or um, constitutional amendment, because otherwise it is not going to cascade in Mississippi. It's just not going to happen. And what we're saying, therefore, when we talk about these things, when we say a majority of states and we don't qualify what they are, I just want people to be aware that most of the time when you say that, you're talking about excluding the majority of the black population in the state. 
you may feel okay about like saying, oh, let's get rid of Florida, let's get rid of Texas. Do you know where the most black people in the United States live? Numerically? Texas, because it's so big, right? The highest percentage of black people live in Mississippi, but in terms of numbers, it's Texas. So we can't kind of like dismiss these places and that is the other reason why this is so important, that whatever is going to be the solution is going to have to be ones that drag along, like the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, that drag along the recalcitrant states that otherwise aren't going to do anything. Yeah, and I, um, I see this um, movement towards a constitutional amendment that if you get resistance from some states or you get resistance from the Supreme Court, it provides the political energy to do other things like making D.C. and Puerto Rico states, if Puerto Rico wants to be a state, uh, and blowing up the filibuster for voting rights legislation, um, enfranchising people in the territories, which Jamie mentioned I talk a lot about in the book. So uh, you know, this is kind of the opening gambit, and then it's a way, as you said, of having a conversation about how dysfunctional our democracy is. And if we have to have a second best solution where we just have protection by statute, it's a lot better than what we have now. Uh, we can't even get the Voting Rights Act restored to where it was before the Supreme Court killed off a key part of it in the Shelby County case in 2013. So we would like to, if anybody has questions, we'll be taking them here. Um, but you have to, should, you need to line up by that microphone. I'm sorry, you guys are going to have to move. <laughs> um, so just line up. We'll take questions. I guess before we, we, we do take the questions, just. Briefly, I mean, obviously, this is not going to happen anytime soon, um, but we have an election coming up, or we're in the middle of an election already. What are the things that you are most, what, what one thing are you most worried about in terms of voting rights uh, for the 2024 election? One thing? Well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm sorry. That's it's all really you have hard. Time I'll, for. Say, I'll, I'll, I'll say. I'll say. Um, I'll say. I'll say. I'm worried that uh, there will be forces that will try to subvert the outcome of the election, and that although Congress and the Supreme Court and the people have all taken steps to make it hard to do what was attempted in 2020, uh, there are other paths by which things can happen, and including political violence. So I feel like now is the time for vigilance. And I, I've been running a series of programs. I'll just make a plug for the Safeguarding Democracy Project. We have uh, webinars. They're all free. They're all archived, safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. We're trying to bring together Democrats and Republicans, people from uh, all different backgrounds, uh, business and unions and religious leaders. How can we assure that, this, that there's a center that is going to protect, um, you know, civil society is what's going to protect us. Uh, we can't rely on any one institution. So I would, okay, just real fast, because we've got tons of questions here. Oh, man. Five <laughs> words. Five <laughs> words. No, I'm mm. okay. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> listen, That's so that can't be a word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do two, but it's going to be so fast, it's going to be like five words. So one, you know, all of the worries about the Supreme Court and their intervention um, in ways that I think can be uh, dif in tremendously difficult, beginning with allowing people who participate in insurrection to be on the ballot. I do think it's also a, a, a going to be a high watermark of misinformation. Um, I think people don't know how effectively many of us who are voting <coughs> rights advocates used Twitter, for example, not only to organize and to educate, but to actually like troubleshoot on election day to find out what was happening at polls and so forth. Um, it has essentially been decimated for that kind of use. And it is a huge, huge blow. And I think people just don't realize how important it was in 2020. I mean, I, you know, I could literally be, um, you know, in 2016 in Alabama, and I would see something on Twitter about something happening in another county. County, I could drive to that county, call the probate judge, and pro troubleshoot it. That's just not there anymore. So um, it, it worries me a lot about what we're, we're going to see on election day. Congressman, mm, but, five words. Well, <laughs> well, the, the, the gentleman's time has expired. <laughs> I, I, um, but last night, I was most worried um, about the Supreme Court's prospective imminent abdication of its very clear duty to disqualify Donald Trump from the ballot under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, mm -hmm. and what that might mean if their decision says that it's really up to Congress on January 5th or January 6th, 2025, 
um, to disqualify him at the counting of the Electoral College votes, which really could lead to something akin to civil war, if that's, if that's what the suggestion is, which is what I think I heard when I went to the oral argument, that they, that they themselves were unwilling to rule whether or not the Colorado Supreme Court was correct in finding that he had engaged in insurrection on January 6, 2021. So, but that, that was just last night's worry. So that, <laughs> <laughs> well, well let, I, let's take some questions. And um, we have a very long line, so um, Quit. We'll, yeah. we'll try to move quickly. OK, well, thank you so much for all being here. This is more of a technical question when it comes to passing an amendment. I, and I totally agree. I think on a federal level, it makes more sense to be able to address this issue that some states aren't going to end up trying to amend their own constitutions, but eventually we're gonna have to get back to the states for them to ratify this amendment. So at some point we will have to get them to rally behind this idea for that amendment to pass. And I'm just curious, maybe you address this, but ultimately what is kind of the solution envisioned in getting states behind the amendment? Well, one thing that's changing is that the, the base of the Republican Party is now um, poorer, less educated, these are people who are more likely to be inadvertently or advertently disenfranchised by state voting laws. Mm -hmm. And so when the partisan valence of this issue shifts a little bit, and it's shifted over time from one party to another, there might be room for bipartisan compromise. The last part of my book, I make the argument, what's in it for conservatives? Because mm -hmm. here I am, yet another progressive, making, you know, I'm speaking to a very sympathetic audience here, but what, you know, how can you, and I make, I make a pitch for making it harder to subvert election outcomes, mm -hmm. making it, um, uh, lowering the amount of election litigation by having universal voter registration mm -hmm. and a national repository of identification that would be kept uh, by the states or the federal government. Like there are things that could be done that would be appealing. And if that fails, at least, you know, there's been an effort to try. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is about term limits. I just feel so passionately that so many politicians these days, the only time they do the right thing is when they're leaving office or they're voted out and then they come back to the media. And I was hoping that someone would mention term limits. And you mentioned cascading down and issues, and uh, you mentioned some structural issues. Uh, I was a caterer downtown for years. Um, I catered the original school shooting and I was devastated by it and I just kept in Connecticut and I just kept saying instead of working on gun laws why don't you work on term limits get term limits done then everything else will follow suit it'll cascade and it'll take care of the structural issues I know that's off, off the off your topic but oh term limits for everybody but Jamie Raskin <laughs> <laughs> he approves of that <laughs> I'm gonna sit down do you, do you want no, you're kind I'm a little bit um, uh, persona non grata in my party because I support term limits. We, of course, have term limits for president. I, I, the only thing I disagree with in your fine statement is I don't think it's a panacea for much of anything. But I do believe in taking turns in democracy, and I think it would, it would help us a little bit. I would not heard that argument before, the creative argument you made that a lot of these members are suddenly doing the right thing on the way out. I, I think three Republicans voted against the stupid impeachment of Secretary Mayorkas, and I think they're all announcing their, their <laughs> departure from Congress. So that's a nice argument. But, um, but uh, generally, no, I, I think we've, um, you know, we, we need some serious political dialogue about democracy and what it means. And uh, I think that can be a little part of the conversation. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it's a real honor to be in the presence of all of you, um, both kind of as a scholar and as a citizen. Um, I've consumed your work for decades uh, as a scholar and as a citizen. I'm deeply indebted to all of you for your work. Um, so I'm a historian uh, at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. And um, imagine my surprise when I opened up your election blog and saw this book coming out. Um, I've been working on this topic of the absence of a right to vote for a number of years now. I was on the 19th Amendment suffrage centennial circuit, kind of speaking about the fact that actually no one ever run a white to vote with the 19th Amendment. And a young man stood up and gave me uh, my idea for the, the book that I'm working on currently. And he said, well, who are the people who fought for the right to vote that I thought I had? And what we have here is a panel of people we've got you know, Mark Pocan has been introducing this amendment. Jesse, the, Jesse Jackson Sr. and Jr. introduced it in 2000, in the 2000s. Um, so uh, 
you know, one thing being a historian teaches you is that we are not, you know, uniquely, um, you know, creative creatures. This stuff has gone on for a long time. So one question I have is, I'm not advocating, but in the book that I'm trying to write, what I'm trying to find are the people on the ground like y'all who've been saying, like, we don't have an affirmative right to vote. Let's create one, beginning with George Julian's, you know, 1869 15th Amendment proposal. Um, and all the way back to the Constitution, but I'm finding that it's kind of like finding a needle, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack. And part of my question is one, like, how would you find these people historically? Because we use this phrase so ubiquitously, not in this specific way of a positive right to vote. Right. Um, and then secondly, the other the other question I have is, um, uh, um, I'm also trying to answer the question, why haven't we ever created one? And I'm curious what your own thoughts are about why that is. Okay, thank so, you. Thank you. So I do look and trace the history, 15th Amendment. There, there were spurts. There was a big spurt in 1959. Uh, the uh, US Civil Rights Commission came out with a report and called for an affirmative right to vote. And uh, it was introduced in uh, first, I think, in 1960 by Representative Badamus in Congress, and then every year thereafter. But if you think about the 1960s, that's when we got the 23rd Amendment giving DC electoral college votes, the 24th Amendment barring federal poll taxes, the 26th Amendment comes in 1971, and that kind of took the wind out of the sails of, um, uh, and, this, and of course the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act come. So we don't need an amendment because we're doing it all through these other smaller steps. And of course now, 1971 is the last time that we amended the Constitution to, well except for the one that was uh, 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 passed in 1791, but ratified in 1992, the 27th Amendment. 26th Amendment, 1971, most Americans, the majority of Americans, were not born, right? They were born after 1971. We've lost our muscle memory when it comes to this. So it really is a question of taking the disparate, you know, there's all kinds of voting groups. You know, Jamie mentioned people who are working on ranked choice voting. There's, you know, there are people who work on uh, you know, different aspects. There's people working on fusion vo voting. There's people, of course, working on civil rights issues. There needs to be a broad coalition. And I don't think people are thinking in big terms today because everybody's fighting in the trenches. And I think Sherilyn could probably address that better than I can. But it's like, how do you have a mo moment to breathe when, you know, the Supreme Court, 21 states this week said that the Voting Rights Act should not contain a private right of action, which means that you'd essentially lose 95% yeah, of the voting rights laws. <laughs> I mean, so when that's happening, it's very hard to think big, but we can't afford not to think big and think small at the same time. I would only say that um, look for the places when there is an effort to deny rights of a whole variety of sorts, like when there's pushback against, and there you will find, you know, I think the people who are having conversations about why can't we do more. Um, you know, we don't have time for this, but you know, if you, it's important to think about the 14th Amendment and Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. So Section 2 of the 14th Amendment, which we don't learn in law school, um, and now people know about Section 3 because of, of the insurrectionists, um, but Section 2 says that any state that denies uh, voting to males above the age of 21, 21 or above, any state that does that will have their representation reduced by the number of people they disenfranchise. And so Jamie, just letting you know, I'm coming shortly with my 14th Amendment Center to you on this one, because we, you know, we, we have a vote, we, we decided to go with the Voting Rights Act, but the Constitution had a plan, had a punishment plan for voter suppression because they knew states would um, try to keep black people from voting. And so I, I, I will say that I so support what Rick is trying to, to do in the conversation he's generating. I'm a big believer in like, mining the existing constitution as well, which I think we've also lost muscle memory for. We just keep do, doing the same thing over and over again. But here we have the solution in section two. The reason I raise it with you is because that section is the first place that the word male occurs in our constitution. Because the principal concern of the northern states because you know there were many uh, black abolitionists, Frederick Douglass, and radical Republicans who wanted to affirmatively include a right to vote for black people in the Civil War amendments. And so much of the resistance came from white men in the North who did not want their wives to vote, did not want this to be a backdoor to woman's suffrage. And that's why Section 2 says 
that if states keep males, first time the word male appear, appears in our constitution, the first time there's a gender, right, an, an explicit gender difference in our constitution is at a time when we're supposed to be expanding right rights, but there are a cadre of people who are afraid that this will be a backdoor to enshrining women with rights. Now that male is overturned by, you know, the constitutional amendment giving women the right to vote. The 21 is overturned by the constitutional amendment giving 18 year olds the right to vote. But that punishment structure remains. Again, note to Jamie. But I would say just, <laughs> but in those debates that there's always at these moments when we have an opportunity to open things up, you then find the people who are both working against it and the people who are carrying forth those ideas. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, hi, it's Rob Ritchie, Fair Vote. And uh, one, I just want to say that we are blessed with three people who really do as much as anyone for voting in democracy and voting rights in this country. So thank you. <laughs> and uh, we lifted this up at Fair Vote for about a decade, quite a lot, uh, working when, when, when Jamie was on our board and Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. was. and and uh, got the whole Black Caucus on the amendment at one point. But the, the ongoing sort of pushback or concern was in this climate of needing to just protect the fire, you know, stop the fires, that lifting up an aspirational long-term goal was actually kind of a distraction. And we always thought it could be an inspiration for the adjacent innovations. In fact, we had a right to vote amendment proposal in our city of uh, Tacoma Park in support of it. And then each member got inspired to lead and be us becoming the first city to lower the voting age to 16 to open apartment buildings so candidates could campaign there to engage with tenants. Each, each one came up with an idea that was actually meaningful in substance. But we didn't, it didn't spread. And then we decided to really zero in on ranked choice voting and, and not kind of run into this conflict with people trying to protect voting rights now. And I'm just wondering how you think we might pivot to, to make it possible to be calling for this and, and still protecting voting rights that have to be done right now. I, I do. Uh uh, talk about the work of Fair Vote and as well as the Advancement Project that had, and Demos, all of these groups in the 2000s, that's kind of the most recent history, along with um, uh, Jesse Jackson Jr. and um, Representative Pocan and Jamie Raskin, who I, th I think the first time you wrote about this was 1997 or something like that, in, uh, and, and in your book, um, I think it's an overruling democracy, there's a whole section. So the conversation's been out there. What I think is different now is that people are not taking democracy for granted in a way, or at least the, the people who did take democracy for granted are no longer taking democracy for granted. And there's a sense, I, I, I've done, this is my fourth event in three days, everywhere I've gone, people are coming up to me and saying, I'm very nervous about 2024. I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> but like, there's a, you know, the, this is in the public consciousness. And so we need to harness that. I say, don't let that turn to despair. You need it to turn to activism. and. You know, here's a place to put it. Look in the appendix of my book. Here's, you know, three pages. You know, this you can organize around this if you want. And I think we, we've got to fight things like, you know, the, 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 what's happening now, the, the relentless attacks on the Voting Rights Act, even after the Supreme Court kind of said, we're sticking with the status quo in this Allen versus for now, Milligan case. For now. And then Justice, I, I, I was just writing this and saying, it was proclaimed as a victory that we kept the status quo, even though Justice Kavanaugh and his concurrence and his vote would matter, said, you know, maybe there's a good constitutional argument to make against Section 2 that would l just look like the argument against Shelby County, but we'll talk about that another day. And so I feel like there's a lot of immediacy that we need to worry about, but we really, if we think small, we're going to be doing this every two and four years. Well, and it's all the organizations that you mentioned that you're t and that you're talking about. You know, so I left um, LDF in 2022. Um, it, for the for the sole reason that I wanted to do what I do a different way, right? And I wanted to create this 14th Amendment Center because we do need to come in and out of the trenches, right? You you do need to have places where you can think and write. I left LB, LDF the first time so that I could teach and write. So I think there is, um, you know, I, we always want people to support our core civil rights organizations, our litigating organizations, our direct advocacy organizations. But I do think we need more people to be supporting Demos and Fair Vote and, and some of the other organizations that are doing, you know, what I think of as kind of the, the big forward looking thinking about what comes next. When you're when you're litigating every day, you know, you're trying to survive this thing and you're trying to hold on. And I take very seriously holding on to statutes that were 
created, um, you know, with the blood, sweat, and tears and lives of people who came before me. So I take it very, very seriously. Um, but it's also true that it becomes such a singular enterprise that it becomes very, very hard to do the kind of work that you're talking about. And so I think getting the word out to people, because people always say, why isn't anybody doing anything? And I'm like, they, people aren't, wait a minute, what? <laughs> you know. So I think we're not as effective you know, in getting the word out about these organizations and what they do and how you can get information that will spark your own thinking about how democracy can be changed. Thank you. Did you want to add anything? Uh, the next question, please. Thank you. Next no, question. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for everything you do for voting rights in this country. Um, and Professor Hassan, I've been reading your election law blog for years, so I highly recommend for anybody interested in the topic to you know, take a look at his blog. Um, it's continuously updated, so there's always new content. Um, knowing what you know about the Constitution and how difficult it is to change it, how realistic is this amendment going to be? I mean, some people are still waiting on that Equal Rights Amendment, right? Right. So there's no Equal Rights Amendment, and then when that was proposed, so now how long do you think it'll take for this amendment to pass, as well as what about the enforcement of the amendment, right? So that's, I think, the devil's in the details with that. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start with the end, which is about the enforcement. So my amendment looks, proposed amendment looks different than every amendment that's in the Constitution, because if you look at, say, the 15th Amendment, it's very general. It says, uh, can't discriminate in voting on the basis of race, and Congress has the power to enforce this by power uh, through appropriate legislation. In my proposed amendment, it says the Supreme Court needs to balance this way, and it needs to defer to Congress in this way, and this should not be read as any kind of diminishment of the rights to vote that are in the earlier amendments, because I do not trust the Supreme Court. I don't trust the Supreme Court that decides Shelby County any more than I trust the Supreme Court in 1903 that wouldn't enforce the 15th Amendment. And if the court is resistant, once this thing passes, then it's time to talk about things like changing the composition of the Supreme Court. So I think we have to think about it as a dynamic thing. I, again, I, I don't think that this is an on-off No switch. reason to wait for that conversation. Why wait? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think of this as an on-off switch. And I would point to the Equal Rights Amendment fight as something that that also gave dividends, even if it didn't lead to the passage in time of that amendment. And it served an important purpose in educating the public as these debates went state by state. Um, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank all three of you for the tremendous leadership you're showing. Um, I've been, this is actually a follow up to the immediate previous question. At any point, as you were putting the book and other work you do together, did you ever visualize what the kind of political mobilization that could be sparked or created in order to deliver the majority, uh, the, the, the supermajority in Congress and the supermajority of the states? Do you have any kind of concrete vision of, of what that would look like and, uh, uh, and how it could be uh, created? Thank you. Well, so I did look at history. And here I drew inspiration from the 19th Amendment and the idea that um, if you move state by state, then you can build a national movement. And um, we have a hyper decentralized election system in the United States. We're going to run 8,800 simultaneous elections for president in eight and a half months. Um, it's really nuts, but it means that there are places that you can affect democracy on the local level, wherever you are. And so that's a place to start. I think. You know, start small but build bigger is, is what I was thinking. Uh, do you want to add anything, Congressman? Um, it's on you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, jeez. You're, you're, well, po you're the politician. <laughs> um, do something. Yeah, well, do something. I, I, <laughs> well, well, what I would say is, um, you know, we got to play defense and offense in 2024. Um, the, the right to vote is under attack in very specific ways in lots of states, especially in uh, some of the deep south states, especially in Florida, which I just returned from, there's just unbelievable stuff going on there. Like uh, if you have to send a mail-in ballot um, uh, or absentee ballot, you have to have a, you can only have it taken to the mailbox or the polls by a n member of your nuclear family who lives with you, okay? Um, so there's a, just a million traps for the unwary that are being set across the country. But at the same time, we do have to uh, get on offense uh, for 
the articulation of a constitutional right to vote that's meaningful for everybody in the country, the millions of people who are left out and disenfranchised, and for everybody whose right to vote is rendered vulnerable by this um, Supreme Court. And um, it's, you know, the, I, I like very much the point that both Sherilyn and Rick have been making about the Supreme Court. I mean, we've got to remember that for the vast majority of American history, the Supreme Court has not been a friend to the people. It has been overwhelmingly in a reactionary or conservative mode. I mean, all the way up until the Civil War, what did the Supreme Court ever do for enslaved people in our country? Absolutely nothing other than cement their status in the Dred Scott decision, saying that African Americans had no rights that the white man was bound to respect. And then even after the Civil War, even after the Reconstruction Amendments, uh, in 1896 in Plessy versus Ferguson, constitutionalizing Jim Crow. And then it's not until the war in court for a couple of decades with the white primary cases and Brown versus Board where you get a different kind of Supreme Court on the side of the freedoms and equality of the American people. But the court is not going to save us. And so that means the only thing that really works is people in motion amending the Constitution, but again, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient because what can be put into the Constitution can slip away from you very quickly. And the greatest example going on right now before our very eyes is Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which they're just disappearing with a magic wand, as if it doesn't exist, even though it could not be clearer what it's stating. And so, you know, they want to kick it to Congress, so it's going to be up to us on January 6, 2025, to tell the rampaging Trump mobs that he's disqualified. And then we need bodyguards for everybody in Civil War conditions, all because the nine justices, not all of them, but these justices who have um, not many cases to look at every no, year, no. not that much work no. to do, a huge <laughs> staff, great protection, simply do not want to do their job and interpret what the great 14th Amendment means. And I'm glad that Sherilyn's creating her new center so we can bring that back to life, even as we're continuing to amend the Constitution, as Professor Hassan has invited us to do. Well, thank you so much, and thank you, everybody. We've run out of time.